and Softec has developed a series of videos for the selection and design of stormwater facilities for land disturbance projects. In this video, I shall show you the design of constructed wetlands, sometimes called stormwater wetlands using Swimsoft VA. Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation, or DCR specification number 13 gives a complete description of these facilities, their performance and criteria for design, their feasibility and design applications, regional and special case design adaptations, their construction and maintenance and community and environmental concerns for constructed wetlands. The pictures and tables shown here are from these specifications. These schematics include typical four bay, aquatic benches, micro pools as part of the facilities. Constructed wetlands, like extended detention ponds are the final elements in the roof, to stream runoff reduction sequence. They do not contribute to any runoff reduction. Therefore, they should be considered only, if there is remaining channel treatment volume or flood protection volume, to manage after all other upstream runoff reduction practices have been considered and properly credited. Constructed wetlands may not be located within jurisdictional waters, including wetlands, without obtaining Section 401 and Section 404 permits from the appropriate local, state, and, or federal regulatory agency. The DCR manual clearly stipulates that stormwater wetlands should not be constructed within an existing natural wetland, unless it is part of a broader effort to restore a degraded urban wetland, and is approved by the regulatory authority. Constructed wetlands are an ideal practice for the flat terrain, low hydraulic head and high water table conditions found at many coastal plain development sites. Table 13.1 gives a summary of stormwater functions provided by constructed wetlands. There are two design levels for wetlands, constructed wetland basin or level 1 design. This is a single cell of a uniform water depth and with a four bay. A portion of the treatment volume can serve as an extended detention or ED above the wetland pool. Constructed multi-cell pond, wetland combination or level 2 design. These are multi-cell wetland and multi-cell pond wetland combination systems, and are effective in moderately to highly urban areas with restricted site area, and providing adequate surface area or grade drop is difficult. The pond wetland combination design involves a wet pond cell in parallel or series, with constructed wetland cells designed to convey small storms through the wetland section while diverting or overflowing the larger storm runoff with minimal ponding depth into the wet pond section. The selection of the particular design type is based on three major factors, the desired plant community, an emergent wetland, level 1 design, a mixed wetland, emergent and forest, or an emergent, pond combination, level 2 design, and, the contributing hydrology, groundwater, surface runoff or dry weather flow and the landscape position, linear or basin, level 2 design. Table 13.2 gives the constructed wetlands design criteria. For level 1 design, the average detention time is 24 hours. There is no extended detention requirement for level 2 designs. The contributing drainage area or CDA for constructed wetlands should be sufficiently large to sustain a permanent water level within the stormwater wetland. Smaller drainage areas are acceptable, if the bottom of the wetland intercepts the groundwater table. Sediment four bays are considered an integral design feature of all stormwater wetlands. A four bay must be located at every major inlet, to trap sediment and preserve the capacity of the main wetland treatment cell. It consists of a separate cell that is formed by an acceptable barrier like, an earthen berm, concrete weir, gabion baskets, etc. The maximum depth in the four bay should be 4 feet near the inlet. This can transition to a 1 foot depth at the entrance to the first wetland cell. The total volume of all four bays should be at least 15% of the total treatment volume. The four bay should be equipped with a variable width aquatic bench around the perimeter of the 4 foot depth area for safety purposes. The aquatic bench should be 4 feet to 6 feet wide at a depth of 1 to 2 feet below the water surface, transitioning to zero width at grade. 
While developing the footprint of the constructed wetlands, the civil and landscape designers shall ensure compliance of all internal design features as specified in the DCR manuals. Side slopes for the wetland should not be steeper than 4 horizontal to 1 vertical. Swimsoft VA deals with the hydraulic design aspects of these BMPs. I now open the project, which we had set up in Video 3. BMP 3 of Outfall 2 is a constructed wetland. I shall use this example to demonstrate the design steps. I go to File, Design BMP Facility. This opens the constructed wetland screen. You will note that the total contributing drainage area at the top and required treatment volume in the bottom are already populated in the screen. Since most constructed wetlands are online facilities, they need to be designed to safely pass the maximum design storm. A maximum depth of 4 feet over the wet pool is recommended. I click on Compute Volume. This opens the Basin Volume Computations Worksheet. This sheet has 6 columns and 12 rows. I need to fill the first two columns only. These are, elevation in feet starting from the lowest bed elevation and surface area at that elevation in square feet. I start filling this data from the first row. I make sure that the elevations keep increasing as I move down each row. Also, as this is a pond, the areas should also increase as the elevation increases. An error message is displayed if the data is incorrect. While there are 12 rows to accommodate up to 11 feet of storage depth assuming that the incremental elevation is 1 foot, it is not necessary to fill in all the rows. It is prudent to fill in areas and elevations up to the top of embankment. Also, you may note that the areas include those of all four bay and micro pool areas. Having entered all the pond elevations and areas, I click the Compute button at the bottom. This will compute and populate all the remaining fields. Column 3 gives the average area in square feet between successive elevations. Column 4 gives the volume in cubic feet between successive elevations. Columns 5 and 6 give the cumulative volumes from the lowest bed elevation to final elevation, in cubic feet and in acre feet respectively. I can always click on clear button at the bottom, which will clear all the six columns. This will enable me to re-enter the first two columns and re-compute basin volumes. Exit will close this screen and puts me back to the previous screen. You will notice that the elevation required for the treatment volume is calculated and entered here. I provide my own elevation, which would be the top of spillway elevation. I now click on Compute Storage button at the bottom. This will compute the storage volume for the proposed elevation. This will also calculate the pool depth relationships desired for constructed wetlands. Level 1 wetland designs may have a mean pool depth greater than 1 foot. Level 2 wetland cells must have a mean pool depth less than or equal to 1 foot. The surface area of the level 1 wetland is less than 3% of the contributing drainage area, while that of the level 2 wetland is greater than 3% of the CDA. Approximately 25% of the wetland treatment volume must be provided in at least three deeper pools, located at the inlet or four bay, the center section, and in the outlet micro pool of the wetland with each pool having a depth greater than 18 inches. Also, approximately 70% of the wetland surface area must exist in the high marsh zone or 0 to 6 inches below the normal pool elevation. You will notice that the program will let us know if the above requirements are satisfied or not. I go to the top menu bar and click on File, Save. This will save all the data including pond elevations and areas. To print the results, I go to the top menu bar and click on File, Print. The print report, which is in Excel format, gives the results including a stage storage curve. The next step is to perform the outlet analysis. I go to the top menu bar and click on File, Outlet Analysis. This opens the Outlet Analysis screen. You will notice that there are two sections here. To the left, you will notice Orifice Details, Spillway Details and Emergency Spillway Details. To the right, 
you will notice that the water quality volume required is already populated. I select 24 hours from the pull-down list for extended detention storage time for level 1 design. I enter the maximum hydraulic head. There are two procedures to determine the orifice size to hold the extended detention storage volume. The program uses the DCR method 2 or the average hydraulic head method, which is also the VDOT preferred method is given in the Virginia Stormwater Management Handbook. This gives the size of orifice in inches. This size is used in the orifice sizing to the left of this form. There are three types of orifices for the user to choose from. Two circular shapes and one rectangular shape are given. The center line elevation of an orifice should be such that the invert of the orifice should be above the lowest bed elevation. A checkbox is provided against each for the user to select. Likewise, there are three types of spillways for the user to choose from. A side open riser a circular riser and the rectangular VDOT standard SWM1 riser are available. There are two types of emergency spillways for the user to choose from. Broad crested weir and weir wall types are available. A checkbox is provided against each of the above for the user to select. I enter the data applicable for the proposed riser structure. I then go to the top menu bar and click on File, Save. This will save all the above data. Next, I go to the top menu bar and click on File, Print. The print report, which is in Excel format, gives the results including a stage discharge curve for the outflow from the constructed wetlands. In order to determine the adequacy of the constructed wetlands to convey safely the 2-year, 10-year and 100-year design storms, it is necessary to route the inflow hydrographs across the pond with due consideration to pond storage and the outflow rates. This is done using the storage indication method routing procedure, as given in section 11, 5, 6, 1 of the V. Drainage Manual. For the inflow hydrograph, the program uses the NRCS dimensionless unit hydrograph. In an event-based model such as the NRCS method, the rainfall hydrograph for the design rainfall event is based on the CN method and the application of the NRCS 24-hour rainfall distribution is well documented. Now that I have the inflow hydrograph, the stage discharge curve and the stage storage curve, I go to the top menu bar and click on File, Generate Hydrographs. This will produce an Excel spreadsheet, which provides recursive computations for the storage indication routing. Inflow and outflow hydrographs are generated for the 2-year, 10-year and 100-year design storm events. For retrofit BMPs with pre-development site areas and inflows, the hydrographs for existing conditions are also generated. I go to File, Summary Table. This opens a new screen giving the drainage areas, pre and post, rainfall depths peak discharges and the corresponding water surface elevations inside the pond for the 2-year, 10-year and 100-year design storm events. The next step in the design of constructed wetlands is to perform outlet analysis. I go to File, Perform Outlet Analysis. This opens the Outlet Analysis Worksheet. You will notice Outlet Barrel Sizing Worksheet to the left and Emergency Spillway Design to the right. The 10-year and the 100-year peak discharges are already populated in the form. I enter the outflow barrel details, its length, diameter, invert, in, invert, out and the barrel material type, concrete, CMP or PV. C. The Manning's end value gets adjusted for the barrel material. I also enter the top of spillway elevation. When I click on Compute button, the program calculates the hydraulic head at the riser. The remarks field will let us know if the water surface elevation in the riser is inside the riser or above the riser, indicating inlet control or outlet control. The barrel size, slope or material can be adjusted to ensure that the water surface elevation is inside the riser. Now I enter the emergency spillway details, its length, width and the emergency spillway top elevation. I also enter the top of embankment and the required freeboard. 
When I click on Compute, the program calculates the head above the weir. The Remarks field indicates if the freeboard is adequate or not. I go to the top menu bar and click on File, Save. This will save all the data including results of outlet analysis. I go to the top menu bar and click on File, Print. The print report which is in Excel format gives the results of outlet analysis. A water balance calculation must be performed to assure that the constructed wetland can be supported by runoff from the contributing drainage area and to assure that deep pools will not go completely dry during a 30-day summer drought. Equation 13.1 of the DCR specifications gives a simplified water balance equation for acceptable water depth in a stormwater wetland. The program uses the more rigorous analysis, as given in Appendix 5C of Volume 2 of the DCR Stormwater Management Handbook. The maximum drawdown due to evaporation and infiltration is checked against the anticipated inflows during that same period. The anticipated drawdown during an extended period of no appreciable rainfall, which can be selected from the pull-down list, is checked as well. This will also help establish a planting zone for vegetation, which can tolerate the dry conditions of a periodic drawdown of the permanent pool. This will also indicate the need or otherwise of a clay liner, if the native soils indicate excessive infiltration. I go to the top menu bar and click on File, Water Balance. This opens the Water Balance screen. You will notice that all, excepting the infiltration rate of basin bed material and the assumed number of days with no rainfall, are populated. Default values are provided in these fields as well. The monthly precipitation and evaporation shown are from Appendix 5C of the DCR Stormwater Management Handbook. The user can always override the default values. I click on Compute in Section A of this worksheet. The remarks will let me know if there is positive water balance with or without liner. I now click on Compute in Section B of this worksheet. The remarks will let me know the maximum drawdown percentage in a 30-day drought situation. I go to the top menu bar and click on File, Save. This will save all the data including results of water balance analysis. I go to the top menu bar and click on File, Print. The print report which is in Excel format gives the results of water balance analysis. This completes the design of constructed wetlands.